Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Tonight is the role of the governor in kingdom administration. Please write that down. Our session tonight is the role of the governor in kingdom administration. We're going to be focusing on the purpose for the gifts and fruit of the Spirit. The purpose for the gift, or the gifts, plural, and the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. First, let me just clarify some things. I want to begin this session with a question. It's a very tricky question. It's a trick question. Here's the question. What would life be like if man had never fallen? I want you to think about that question. I don't want an answer now. But I want you to think because it is a real legitimate question. What would life be like if man, if Adam had never sinned? First of all, obviously, there'd still be a planet like we have today. Obviously, there'd still be humans on it like we have today. Obviously, there would be billions of humans on the planet. So, second question. What would they be doing if man had never fallen? Just think about it. The first command God gave Adam may be a hint to one of the questions. It's found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and commanded him, first command, work. Everybody say work. Everybody say work. That's important. Work is not a sign of the curse. Work was established by God before man sinned. So work is not the curse. Work is God's first command. Which means that work is why you were created. God did not command man to sing to clap. He didn't command man to pray. As a matter of fact, none of these items are found in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And yet, these are the only chapters in the Bible where we find these words, and the Lord says, this is very good. In these chapters, there's no command to meet and have meetings and worship. God never told us to do that. God told Adam, work. So, whatever we are doing now is not God's original plan for our lives. An emphasis is on original. In other words, these religious things that you are going through, that you grew up with, whether you are here in the Bahamas or the Caribbean, or whether you are in America watching this program in Canada, in England, folks are watching us down in Africa, South Africa, I know you're watching, you know, wherever you are, all the religiosity, whether it is Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, or Christianity, God never intended any of this. God never expected nor intended for us to meet together and sing songs. It's not a command in God's mandate in Genesis. God never expected us to come together and try and get his presence by worship activities. These are serious issues. Let me take the question further. If man had ever never fallen, would there still be a need for apostles, prophets, 
evangelists, pastors, teachers. These are not mentioned anywhere in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. There's no mention of any apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Why? Because all of these are only necessary because of the fall. Therefore, the things that we call great functions are really products of the fall. <laughs> if man had never fallen, there'd be no need for Calvary, no need for resurrection, no need for church meetings, no need for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, ushers, ministry of helps, musicians. There'd be no need for them. And based on the biblical text, apparently it seems as if God will get rid of them eventually again. Matter of fact, it is God who spoke through Paul and says, tongues shall cease, prophecies shall cease. There'll be no need for no one to teach you anymore. They'll be in your heart. In other words, God's going to get rid of everything you've been trying to get. Yes, yes. Some of you can't wait to be a pastor. God's going to get rid of that. Yes, 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 yes. Why? Because this entire program that we're involved in right now was not God's original plan. Now, why do I stop in such controversy? Because I want you to understand that God's original plan was never and still is never religion. God's plan is very specifically stated by God himself. It's found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness and let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, livestock of the field, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the ground. So, verse 26, the Lord God created man in his own image, created him male and female, verse 27, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, and have dominion over all the earth, period, period, period. No singing, no dancing, no prayers, no fasting, no nothing. Just dominate. The word dominion is the word mamlakak in Hebrew and it's the same word for kingdom. So the assignment God gave humanity was kingdom. I boy say kingdom. Write the king, the word kingdom down please. We're going to talk about that. A kingdom is a government under a king. A kingdom has nothing to do with religion. It is a governing political concept. It is a government under a king. Very important. That's point number one. So the first thing Jesus, uh, God gave humanity was a government. Government responsibility on earth. Matter of fact, the word dominion means to govern, to rule, to control, to manage, to lead, and to have authority over. It's an amazing word. It means to control the environment. It means to manage resources. That's what a king does. A king manages his kingdom. So the assignment God gave man was an administrative assignment. Therefore, we can understand how kingdoms work. All kingdoms expand themselves through a system called colonization. By the way, is, is my uh, item up on the board? I'm having some problems. Can you please switch? Help me out, please, Mikey. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very important for you to understand that a kingdom expands or extends itself through a process called colonization. Colonization is when a kingdom rules a territory that's a far away from it through a system called colonization. Colonization is when a king takes some of his citizens and put them in a foreign land and those citizens make that land just like the kingdom. That's called colonization. Point number three, very important, and that is a kingdom delegates the administration of its government in the colony to a person 
called a governor. So whenever a kingdom takes territory and it wants to rule that territory, it places in that territory delegated authority through a person the king calls governor. In the Bahamas, now those of you who would be old enough to know this, uh, when I was born in 1954, the Bahamas was under a kingdom. We were under a kingdom for almost 200 years as a country. Actually, we were not a country. We were what they call a colony. And in the Bahamas, growing up, there was one man in this country that was the ruler of this country. And he lived in a house not too far from here. That house was called the governor's mansion. All of you probably know where that house is. It's a big pink wall. It's an entire block that England created. And England built in that block around circle with that pink wall, a big massive house that is called the governor's mansion. And a person was sent from England to live in that house. The reason why they were sent there is because they were sent from the queen's court to live in the Bahamas to make sure that the Bahamas becomes just like England. That's the purpose for a governor. A governor is to come from the king to the colony, live in the colony, and he was given delegated powers to administrate the king's wishes in the colony. Is that clear? Are you sure? All right. Point number four then becomes critical, and that is the governor is empowered by the king to delegate powers and assignments to whom he will. In other words, when the governor from England lived in the Bahamas, the Queen of England and the King of England did not choose the local administrators. They left that up to the governor. So the governor in the Bahamas appointed people from the local administration pool and gave them powers to administrate under his authority the king's wishes. When a governor comes to a colony, he only comes to do the will of the king or the queen. That's why he comes. When he delegates authority to anybody, he has given them that power to only do the will that he received from the king, which means that everybody is basically working for the king's will. So in England, when they said, we should drive on the left-hand side of the street, just like they do, then the governor says, everybody got to drive on the left-hand side of the street. So he instructed all the, the authorities in the country that he appointed, whether it's the chief of police or the chief of road traffic, whatever, he says, now everybody must drive on the left. They said, put up signs, he made sure they carried everything, and they had to carry out the administration of that, and now we drive on the left, so we look just like England. That's the power of a government's delegation. Leading to number four. These delegated powers are only for the purpose of the kingdom. In other words, when a governor appointed somebody and gave them authority and power to act, they could only use that in the service of the kingdom. They couldn't use it for personal gain, they couldn't use it to build up their own ego or their own reputation. They had to use it for the reason of promoting the kingdom only. Because it was not their power. It was given by delegation from the governor. Is this clear? Every kingdom works that way. You remember in the day of Jesus, Jesus was born under a kingdom. And God actually made sure he was born under a kingdom so that all the components and the prototypes were present. That's why it took Jesus 4,000 years to get to earth. Because no empire before the Roman Empire had established a kingdom similar to the kingdom of God. So God waited until the exact prototype was present. And then the Bible says, Galatians chapter 3, it says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, right on time. Why did God wait for 4,000 years? Because he had to wait until the system was in the earth that was similar to heaven's system of kingdom, so that when Jesus spoke, everyone understood his words, because the concepts were present. Is that clear? Now, if you study the Roman Empire, Caesar was the king, and he lived in Italy. Italy is far away from Palestine, in the Mediterranean, you know, on, on, on the, the western side. And so, you find that when Rome took over the whole of Europe, they took over all over the Middle East. They ruled everything. Jesus Christ was born in a little town in the Roman Empire, far away from Caesar. Caesar was the king. But in the area where Christ was born, 
it was called a colony. The colony was called Palestine. And Caesar the king sent to that area a governor whose name was Pilate. Pilate's job was to make sure that the whole area acted and thought and spoke and lived just like Rome. That's why you hear the statement, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That was a serious policy. If you are in Roman territory, act like Romans. That's what that means. You eat like Romans, dress like Romans, talk like Romans. You spoke Latin. Matter of fact, that's why Latin became such a powerful element in the church later on. Because all of Rome ruled the world. And they made all the religious activities in Latin. Because Latin is Roman language. It's not a heavenly language. So Christ was born in the middle of a kingdom just like his. Caesar's job was only to carry out, or should I say Pilate's job, was only to carry out the will of Caesar in that territory. Pilate's job was to convert Palestine into Rome. So the delegated powers that he was received was only for the sake of Rome. He couldn't use it to build up his own kingdom. As a matter of fact, any governor that acted and began to behave as if he was the king was killed. The governor only says what the king told him to say. He only does what the king told him to do. He was a total extension of the king. And therefore, these delegated powers were called privileges or gifts, gifts of the king. Now, when you talk about delegated powers, they had to be gifts because to delegate means you don't own it. That's why it's called gift. It's a gift. You didn't earn this. You didn't work for this. It's delegated. That's why when you talk about the Holy Spirit, the governor, he comes to the territory with gifts. They are called gifts of the Spirit. These are delegated abilities he brings with him to give to whom he chooses in the territory to do administration work for the kingdom. These are gifts of the governor. Everybody say gifts of the governor. Say it loud, gifts of the governor. So the entire concept of gifts of the Spirit have to do with this term, I want you to get used to it, kingdom administration. It's not about religion, it's not about spookiness, it's not about falling down, rolling over and screaming, all that stuff we do. It's about administration. It's government business. Every spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit given to you as a person is a government delegated gift for government business. It's not to make you feel good, it's not to give you a thrill, it's not to make you run around and do funny stuff. It is given to you for activity that promotes the government's interest in the territory. Amen. Very important. So the gifts of the Spirit are for kingdom administration. Let me, let me say it this way. The governor is responsible for government administration in the colony. All government governors in a kingdom are. Now, if you are from America, this doesn't make any sense to you. Because in a republic, especially a federation, the governors in those concepts are different. As a matter of fact, the governor in every state in America are independent from the president. In, act, in, in actual fact, let me put it this way. The United States, for example, is a conglomeration of nations. Every state is, a, that's why it's called a nation. It's a state. The state is a nation. The leader of that state is called the governor. <laughs> so the United States has 54, 54 governors, I guess, 54, how many states? 50. So they got 50 governors. Why? Because each state is a country. Florida is a country. Atlanta is a country. Sorry, uh, Georgia is a country. And the head of that country is the governor. So the governor doesn't take instructions from the president. 
He's an independent person chosen by the people in that little state. That's a country. The president of the United States does not appoint the governors. They are voted in by the people in the state. They are the head of the state. That's why even though Washington may make some decisions concerning laws, the state can actually disagree with it. That's why you can have a governor in California, for example, who can choose that lesbianism or gay rights will be, you know, they can get married in the state, and the other state disagrees. Because they're two different countries. Do you understand this? So the president has no influence over the governors in that republic. However, a governor in the kingdom is completely opposite to that. First of all, the governor is appointed by the king, and all he can do is what the king tells him. That's why the governor have to call the king Lord. The word Lord means owner. Do you remember when one time Pilate was, you know, talking to the people and Christ was up next to him? And they were trying to crucify Jesus, you know, a claim for his life. The argument was, how can you let him go? And Pilate says, I find no fault in this guy. You guys got a personal issue with him, and I don't. And they said, you got to crucify him. He says, I don't, because I don't find anything legally wrong with him. Then the people said something that frightened him. They said, if you don't crucify him, we will send a message to Caesar, which says that you allow two things. One, you allow another king in the territory. Ooh, that's, that's, that's treason. And two, we have no Lord but Caesar. When Pilate heard those two statements, even though he hated to do it, that's why he washed his hands. He realized that his political life was in trouble. Because you see, the governor can never go against the king in a kingdom. He only does and says and acts based on the king's will and instructions. Is that clear? Okay, now you'll understand some things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom of God, placed in the colony of earth to bring the earth to look like heaven. Christ says when he comes, he will not speak of himself. He will only say what I tell him to say. And he will not seek his own glory, only to glorify the king, yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. You can never get the Holy Spirit to disagree with Jesus. Don't even try. He's the governor. And he's in the colony of earth to convert earth into heaven. That's why it says the spirit knoweth how to pray it. The willeth of God it. And then he says, here's the willeth of God it, how to pray it. He said, pray it like this. It. Our father who is where? in heaven that's the headquarters country holy is your name he's in a prayer thy kingdom influence come and thy will there it is be done where on earth how like it is in heaven he says you pray your number one prayer should be for earth to look like heaven period and that's why the governor is here when you do that god has to answer your prayer there's one prayer god have to answer when you pray so every time you pray you should always pray that one prayer don't pray for food and clothes, anything. Pray, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done today, this Monday morning, this Tuesday, this Wednesday, the whole day, in my job, in my family, in my home, in my body. Let your government come. Let your influence come in my school, in my college, in my life, in my thinking, in my business, in my investment. And God begins to rule in those areas and the kingdom comes into your life. It's not about religion. I want you to get out of your head. It's not religion. It's government. Write this down. Gifts, therefore, are the distribution and the delegation of powers by the governor to the citizens that he chooses to execute government business in the colony. If you don't understand that statement, you won't understand the Bible and you'll make it a religious book. 
the gifts that the governor brings are delegated powers that he distributes as he wills to whom he will for the purpose of executing kingdom administrative activities on earth. That's why the gifts are given by the governor, the Holy Spirit. Very important. And the third point, therefore, is critical. And that is the gifts are given by the governor as the governor decides. This is very important. You can't tell the governor which gift you want. The Bible says, and I'll read it in a few minutes, it says that he gives the gifts as he wills to whom he wills. That's why you might not like the person who got that one, but that ain't your business. So why, why did God bless us? Because the governor has a prerogative. <laughs> in the Bahamas, when the governor was ruling us under England, the governor could appoint anybody to be premier. Can appoint anybody to be a permanent secretary. And it was the governor's responsibility and his obligation and his right to appoint. The governor in a colony has total powers of appointment. Very interesting. As a matter of fact, here's something real strange. You'll understand this now. In a, in a kingdom, and we still got a little bit left in the Bahamas. That's why we're still arguing right now about whether the governor should represent the queen still. Because you see, in a kingdom, you got this problem. The problem is the king or the queen is the ultimate authority. So, under the, the kingdom of Great Britain, we were, there, were under the kingdom, if the governor appointed, uh, chose you, that they're going to give you a knighthood, or an OBE award, which is what I got from the Queen already. It is done locally first. In other words, the governor in the society, in the community, in the colony, would say, I am going to give you an OBE award. Then the governor would send your name to England, and it will call, and it will actually be said, on recommendation of the governor. Now, once the governor, this is deep now, once the governor recommends somebody, the king and queen automatically accepts them. That's deep. That means once the Holy Ghost says, you okay? Christ says, you okay. Give God a praise for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost says, you forgiven? Brother, heaven says, forgiven! If the Holy Ghost says, bless him, Lord have mercy. Heaven says, gather all this stuff, let's dump it on him. Why? Because the governor recommends a blessing. That's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives the gifts to whom he will. He doesn't refer to Jesus for that one. He makes recommendations to Jesus. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in the colony and he knows your life. Oh, you missed that one. So you can't go around the governor and talk to Christ. He's nice, a nice person. Say, no, no, I watch you all day. I live in you. You ain't no good yet. You can't get promotion yet. If the governor promotes you, you are promoted. Yes, sir. That's why a lot of folks think they, think they can get away with stuff secretly. The governor is living with you every day in your dark, secret moments. You're asking God to bless you. The governor says, I live with that one. Don't bless that one. Got some problems, still trying to work on some conditions. That's why he, the governor, convicts you of sin. Not Jesus. The governor convicts you because he lives in the colony. He knows where you are lacking, where you are weak, where you are struggling, and he works on it. He says, look, you got to fix this area before God uses you for the next level. He lives in the colony. Where's Christ? He's in heaven. See that right on the Father praying for you. But the Holy Ghost, where is he? He's right in the middle where you got, right in the middle of the mess where you are. He knows everything about you. You can't fool Jesus. <laughs> the Bible says that the spirit knoweth the deep things of God and reveals them to you and to him. It's very important to understand that the gifts are given by the government's prerogative. And this next point, number four, the gifts are only for government service. 
Please write this down. This is very important. See, a lot of folks lately have been using the gifts for their own private development, their own private pros prosperity. People selling prophecies, man. You know, if, <laughs> listen, if the government gives you a, a government vehicle, <clears throat> uh, let me take a deep breath before I finish the sentence. If the government gives you a red license plate vehicle, is that yours? No. So if the government sees you on Sunday with your 10 children on the back of that truck going on a picnic, they could literally stop you in the road and get everybody out. Why? It's not for your private personal pleasure. So it is with all government gifts. Mm -hmm. When God gives you a gift by the Holy Spirit, that ain't for your private personal benefit. It's government business. And so we got miracle workers selling miracles. We got people with prophecy in tongues selling prophecies to people. Call me now, send me $10, $10, I'll give you a prophecy. You got a problem in your life, just call me 100 bucks, I'll prophesy to you. And I've seen this, I've been in meetings where I puked, spiritually puked. I couldn't believe they were doing it. And these are well-known people who you run after sometimes. Watch who you are now. These are illegal people stealing government gifts. Abusing the gifts of the government. Gifts of healing. Selling healings. And the healings are real, you know, it's a gift. But they are using it for private prosperity. Every gift of the government is for government benefit. So every time you use a gift of the Spirit, it should be to promote the kingdom of God, not your private kingdom. Let's talk about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. I don't want you to use these gifts without understanding, Paul says. The governor comes to the earth to give you delegated powers, he says you got to understand them and you got to learn about them. Look at the next verse. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is deposited guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now what this means is, just simply put, that God deposited deposited the governor on earth as a guarantee that there is a king. <laughs> if you never saw the king, the proof that the king exists is the presence of the governor as a deposit in the colony. Ah, listen, when I, when I was growing up as a kid in this country, every morning we had to sing to the queen and king of England. Every morning in school. We wore those short pants, long socks, you know, a little tie, and man, we stood in the hot sun, 95 degrees. I mean, hot sun, four years old. God save our gracious queen. Long live our noble queen. God save our queen. Born to rule over us, rightly and glorious. Born to rule over us. God save the queen. Are we singing, man, with our whole heart? Every morning we worship them. I never saw them. That's important. You don't need to see him to worship him. People say to me, well, how can you believe in a God you can't see? How come you made me sing to a queen I never saw? The only proof we knew that there was an England is there was this white man from England spoke in a pipe who walked around our island speaking English, you know. And he was the proof that there was a queen somewhere. Oh, hallelujah. The governor was the deposit guaranteeing that there was an inheritance of a kingdom. Somewhere, once the governor is present, the kingdom is present. Shout amen, somebody. Paul says, when you received salvation, you believed, you were marked. There it is. You were marked in him. How? By the deposit. You don't need Jesus. 
The governor is enough. And that's why when you receive Jesus Christ and his words, you receive the governor to live inside you. That's a deposit in the colony that the king is alive and well. Hallelujah. Ten roles of the governor. Write these down very quickly. There are ten roles that the governor performs. And you're going to see how they work right now. Number one, the governor is appointed by the king. Number two, he only comes from the kingdom. Now that's important. That's important. Let me pause here. See, the governor in a kingdom never comes from the colony. There was no Bahamian governor as long as we were under the kingdom of Great Britain. Because the governor never comes from the colony. Do you know why? Because <laughs> anyone from the colony cannot change the colony. If the colony is to be transformed to become like the kingdom, then no one in the colony can transform it because they don't know what the kingdom is like. That's why the governor had to be sent from the kingdom to the colony. That's why Christ says, when I leave, I will send you another comforter. And he will guide you. He will teach you. He will train you. Why? He's coming from my father, he says, from the kingdom. Give God a praise for the governor coming from the kingdom. Praise God. That's why the Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit. Because there ain't no Holy Spirits on earth. He came to make us holy like our Father in heaven is holy. He only comes from the kingdom. Number three, he only represents the king. The governor of a kingdom only represents the king. He doesn't represent himself. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will not speak any words of his own. He will only tell you what I tell him to say. Number four, the governor only expresses the mind and will of the king. The governor doesn't speak his own mind. In our country, when the governor of England lived here all those 200 years, everything that governor says was exactly what the king told him to say to us in the colony. He couldn't give us his own ideas. He couldn't give us his own intentions or his own perspective. He had to keep saying, in the name of the king, in the name of the king, in the name of the king. Why? I, whatever I speak, in the name of the king. Matter of fact, even when he got the instructions for the year for our colony, these were called <laughs> the message from the throne. We still use the term because we're still under the colony, you know, the Commonwealth. Even though we're independent, we still got the queen. So even the prime minister got to give his plans to the governor. The governor got to read them and he got to say the message from the throne because we're still under the Commonwealth. When the Holy Spirit speaks, that's Jesus talking. That's a good place to shout amen, you missed it. That's why in the book of Revelations, Christ was talking to the church. But listen how he said it. He says, listen to what the Spirit say to the churches. Even though it's him. In the colony, he talks through the governor. You know, let me say something that's very complicated, very confusing to me when I was a little boy. I couldn't understand how people were praying to Jesus. And even today, I don't understand it even today. We are not supposed to pray really to Jesus. <laughs> Christ never told us to pray to him. Read your Bible carefully. John 16, John 7, 18, he very specific instructions very carefully. He said, when you pray, pray to the Father. That's the government. In my name, that's the authority. And the Holy Spirit shall deliver it. Hmm. Because what? The Holy Spirit knows the will of God. He knows the mind of the government. So if you don't know how to pray, then pray in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and you'll be praying the mind of God. That's why your prayers will automatically be answered. This is why praying in tongues is so important. When you pray in tongues, you cannot make a mistake. When you pray in English, chances are you're making up your own suggestions to God. That's why a lot of our prayers don't get answered. We come to God all kind of eyes. Well, Lord, you know, I want you to bless Cheryl. God said, what do you mean by bless? I put Cheryl in this mess to make her grow up. Don't tell me bless and take her out. Uh-oh. 
I mean, imagine if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was your pastors. And you heard that they were put in prison in Turkey. You know, the country there. And they sent back message, we are getting, we're about to go into a fiery furnace. Church, pray. Now, what would you pray? See, that's the problem. What would you pray? I know what you'd pray. You'd pray your mind. Oh, God, deliver them. Oh, God, put the fire out. Oh, God, kill the king. We got in deep prayers. We'll, we'll never pray, oh, God, take them in and go in with them. We never pray that. And yet that was God's will. Take them into the fire and he can be with them and ain't nobody going to get burned. Now that's something you would never pray, but that's praying according to the Spirit. Eight chapter of Romans says, there are times, eight chapter of 1 Corinthians, rather, 1 Corinthians 8, it says there are times when you do not know what you ought to pray for. He said when that happens, pray in the Spirit with utterances that cannot be uttered. In the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Ghost knows the mind of God. You don't speak in tongues, you better get it. Praying in tongues is safe because it is the Spirit talking to Jesus and the Father. You can't miss. Hallelujah. Write this down. The governor is responsible for converting the colony into the kingdom. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here not to take you to heaven. Let me repeat this. The Holy Spirit is on earth not to take you to heaven. Because if, if that was the purpose, he should kill you a long time. Quickest way to go. He's here to change your behavior and your culture. He's here to make earth like heaven, not to take earth to heaven. Thy will be done on earth, just like it is. That's his job. So he's here to convert us into kingdom citizens while we are on earth. Number five, the role of the governor is to transfer kingdom culture, values, morals, nature, language, and lifestyle to the colony. I believe that the Bible has been so grossly misunderstood that we have literally created something God knows nothing about and it's called religion. What God wanted was a, a society and a culture, not a religion and, a, and an exclusive group or something that we call church. He wanted a culture of a society manifested in a people. That's why God made Israel... He didn't make Israel a church or a religion. He made them a nation. And he told them that the people shall know the difference between you and them because of the God you serve and the way you live. What do we do? We build our buildings, put stained glass so no one can see us, put a belt and everybody knows it's time to come and we hide behind these walls and we have some rituals. Be it far from God for such a thing. Christ said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good behavior. And when they see it, they will give the credit, glory to God, say, they must be from another place. That's what he intended. But instead of exposing ourselves, we hide ourselves in these places called church buildings. We almost got a secret society called Christianity. What a tragedy. Number seven, the, government, the, the governor prepares subjects for citizenship. You know, because you are in a kingdom doesn't mean that you are automatically a citizen. I want to just state that very clearly. When I was born in the Bahamas, and some of you who are older remember this, and even J Jamaica and Trinidad and other places will also know about this, that even though we were under the, the, the kingdom of Great Britain, we, we were not citizens of England. Did you know that? You didn't know that. Okay, let me explain that to you. We were born in the Bahamas, grew up in the Bahamas. My father, all my parents, they were never citizens of Great Britain. We were under Great Britain. We were called subjects. A subject is not automatically a citizen. Why? Because citizenship is a privilege. 
The government of England decided whether you are a citizen or not. Do you know why? Because once you become a citizen, you have access. Glory, hallelujah. Oh. That's why they didn't give citizenship so easily. They would rule you, but not necessarily make you a citizen. Here's why. Because in a kingdom, the king chose citizens. Personally. That's why Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. Because in a kingdom, the king chooses who will be in his kingdom. And once the king chooses you, glory, hallelujah, that means you have total access to everything in the kingdom. A subject, <laughs> a subject have, have welfare without rights. A citizen has welfare with rights. So when you are a subject, follow me now, then the king could do anything to you, even kill you. Why? You're just property. But once you are a citizen, now you are part of the kingdom family. Do you remember when Paul was being whipped? by the Roman government. They were whipping Paul with a whip. And in the middle of the whipping, Paul remembered something. Blood all over his back, everything all torn up. I mean, Paul was just, you know, just beaten up. And in the middle of it, Paul screamed out and says, I am a Roman citizen. The Bible says the soldiers dropped the whip and ran. Paul was a Jew, but his father apparently was of such high respect in that city of Tarsus that he was able to secure Roman citizenship for himself and his children. And when they heard that Paul was a Roman citizen, a kingdom citizen, the Bible says they ran to the centurion and says, oh, we have done great wrong. We will be punished for we have whipped a Roman citizen. And the centurion became very afraid. And the Bible says the centurion went to Paul and begged Paul, please do not report us. That's in your Bible. Why? It's the power of citizenship. And that's when Paul says, not only am I going to report you, but I'm going to take my case to Rome. And the rest is history. They had to take him. Let me tell you something. You better be glad that Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you he says you understand no you don't understand let me help you understand that's why he says therefore once you are a citizen wherever any two of you get together and agree on anything it shall heaven have to Here's what it means by citizenship. Because you are a citizen, he says, I've appointed you. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, see, you can everybody say access. Yeah. Access, my son. He says, he says, citizenship gives you access and rights. Christianity doesn't give you rights. It gives you religion and rituals. Jesus said, your religion, he says, is lip service. The governor's job in the Bahamas was to develop citizens to the point where they were qualified to become citizens. And by the way, the first, oh boy, can I say it? In a kingdom, in a country, the Bahamas too, the first order of business was language. 
When, when I was born in the Bahamas, the first thing they said, you got to speak English. Why? We're training you for citizenship. But the first thing is language. You got to speak the British English. Sometimes you wonder why most of our old politicians are so British. And many of our old preachers are so British. Because that was colonial training. If you didn't speak the Queen English, you weren't promoted. Yeah, see, you remember that? Yeah. He said, how can the people get promoted? Because they, they finally got it, you know. Jolly well old chap. Come on, you're a black man speaking. Jolly well old chap. Come on, you know, you're from Africa, but jolly well old chap. And so they promoted you, and everyone promoted, spoke that way. Promoted, spoke that way. Why? That's why Christ says, as many believed, they first thing shall speak with new tongues. Government training. I say governor training. I say governor training. When the Holy Spirit come upon you and baptize you, he takes over your tongue. First order of business, learn to speak the kingdom language. It comes with the territory. And next, the governor's role is that he lives in the residence built by the government. You know, the, the, the governor in a kingdom never lives in a house built by the people in the colony. In other words, you, you cannot build a house for the governor in a colony. It's always built by the, by the king. So God, hallelujah, set it all up, eh? He said, look, I'm going to live in the earth. I'm going to send my governor to represent me. And he will not live in any buildings. I built my own buildings. Acts chapter 17. I love it. Verse 24. It says, For God does not live in buildings made by men's hands. He says, For your body is the temple of the holy governor he made the body with his own hands your body is the residence of the governor give god a praise that's why he said keep your body clean keep it holy because you got a holy resident on the inside shout amen somebody that's why you can't just sleep with anybody if you got the governor on the inside you don't lay him down with anybody the bible says the tables of god cannot touch with the tables of demons That's why they got a pink wall around the whole governor's mansion to keep it pure. And the wall is so high, you can't climb up. They're going to keep stuff out. Your body should be that way. Put a lock around your body and tell anybody you can't come up in here. You come through the gate with a ring. Shout loud. Please. I say shout loud. This is politics. This ain't religion. The governor, if he lives in you, your residence is off limits. You can't just drink what you feel like, how much you feel like. That ain't your house. You can't just smoke and suck on what you feel like. That ain't your house. You can't just watch what you feel like with your eyes and read what you feel like with your eyes. You, that's not your house. Mm. You can't shack up with the house. Don't get quiet now. <laughs> See, we don't understand. This is not the religion. See, in Christianity, you can shack up and sing in the choir the next day. You know, problem, that's religion. But in the kingdom, you can do that. <laughs> Your body is the residence of the Holy Governor, the Holy Spirit. Write this one down. His presence is evidence of the kingdom. His presence, his presence rather, is evidence of the kingdom. If the governor is present, the kingdom is present. And finally, the governor is removed when the colony declares independence. On July 10th, 2000, sorry, 1973, 
the Bahamas kicked the governor out in a very nice ceremony. Now listen to me, friends. At 11.55, I was there. I stood on the park, 1973, in the Bahamas. And I watched, and there were thousands of people in there with me. And we all didn't realize what we were doing. We were declaring independence from a kingdom. The kingdom used to keep all of our roads for us. They provide water for us. They, they provide all the protection. They provide all the police. They provide all the soldiers. They had their ships out there to protect us. We didn't do anything. We just enjoyed stuff and ate peanut butter. You know, we had free stuff, free cheese. I mean, everything, the roads were kept by the government of England. Everything was, oh, everything was done by the government. The food came in from the government of England. Everything was free. And that night, we didn't realize, we're getting rid of all of that. Independent means you govern yourself. And that's what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. He raised the human flag. And the flag of the kingdom of heaven was lowered. And in one act of disobedience, the governor became illegal. Let me tell you something. At 1201, the governor of England was illegal in the Bahamas. He was gone the next day. Couldn't stay here. Why? He was illegal. When you declare independence, the governor is illegal. Suddenly they knew that they were naked. The Bible says suddenly. It happens that fast. You tell God you don't want him in your life, no problem. Run your own life. Or let me use another word, ruin your own life. There's a way that seems right unto man, God says. But the end of that way is destruction. Let me tell you something, friends. This colony was designed for the governor. Without him, there's chaos. Nuclear war. Bird flu. AIDS epidemic. People dying from poverty, dropping to the ground. Tension in the Middle East. Terrorism everywhere. Oil prices unstable. Political upheaval. Social duress. Crime. Sodomy. Lesbianism. Homosexual abuse. Broken homes. Divorce. Growing up with only one parent. Don't tell me we're doing a good job. This place was designed to be ran by the governor. So he said, without me, you can do nothing. And ever since he left, if you study the story of it carefully. The day he left, the next day, a brother killed his brother. Huh. He left. The purpose for Jesus coming to earth is to bring the governor back. And he comes with gifts. In our next session, we're going to talk about that, those gifts, because we're going to show you that there are different gifts that he brings. And he brings them for administration. I remember the day he took a residence in my mansion. I was 13 years old. And you know what? He never left. And maybe he's not in you tonight. Young person, old person. Maybe you've been religious, but you never had the governor. Let me tell you something. The Aquinas Club can't give you the governor. The Key Club can't. Rotary can't give you the governor. Speech groups and clubs can't give you the governor. Red Cross can't give you. Good works can't give you the governor. Christ says, if any man comes unto me, I will not cast him out. If any man comes unto me, him, he says, 
And we will come and make our abode in you, he says. You can take up residence. You don't really want God. You need God. Because life don't make sense without God. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.